Welcome back to Flushing It Out with Samantha Spittle. This week's guest is Emily Yarrison. Emily joined us in the studio before we started our social distancing. And when she came, we had a few different ideas of what we discussed. And we thought we are not going to talk about storytelling. But spoiler alert, we did talk about storytelling. And so we talk about kind of the process of storytelling, how to put together a story in the different parts, and how it can really magnify moments of your life, that it's not always about telling all of your story. It's taking those moments and using them as teachable examples. And so I think this is great for everyone to listen to, whether you're a parent, a leader, um, a teacher. Uh, basically, anyone who wants to communicate and connect with people, she has a great way of breaking down how to tell a story and kind of help getting your wheels turning so that you can use moments in your life for connection. Get ready as we flesh it out. Coming to you from the M&M Exterior Studio in Knoxville, Virginia, this is Flushing It Out with Samantha Spittle, the introvert's extrovert. She talks to people so you don't have to. For now. Welcome back to Flushing It Out with Samantha Spittle. I'm here with two-time returning guest, Emily Yarrison. Hi. uh... (laughs) Welcome back. Hey, thank you. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you for coming back. Um, Emily, if you uh, listened to her last episode, you would remember that she is the Moth Grand Slam champion from 2019. For those of you who don't know, uh, Story Slam, um, the Moth is a storytelling competition. It's broadcast mm-hmm. on I think the PBS Public Radio. NPR. NPR, there we go. Yeah, it's an NPR show and podcast uh, that's been around for a while, I think over 10 years. And um, it started in New York. um, And now there are monthly shows, like live shows all over the country. And I was lucky enough to uh, win a Story Slam, which is the monthly event. And then that qualified me for the Grand Slam which happened at the Lincoln Theater the day before Thanksgiving in front of 1,200 people. Yes. Uh, And I was lucky enough to win that, which was very cool. Amazing. And we were there for it. Yeah, you came. It was awesome. It's very sweet. Thank you. It was very awesome. So we are back today because Emily and I have um, been getting to know each other thanks to the storytelling world. And Mm -hmm. um, And I think just our, like, energy. Yeah, that's what I was – I was like, just – because. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking as I was listening to your stories, because I was like, well, what are you passionate about? And I think one thing that I know about you is you're passionate about storytelling, whether it's professionally, mm-hmm. like with the moth or just at breakfast, like we were this morning telling mm-hmm. stories. So I thought, I think it would be good to take advantage of our time together mm-hmm. to kill three birds with one stone. And I just thought of three off the top of my head. But one, to talk about your process of storytelling, okay. to share your yeah. brilliance with people, to, to have me learn and hear your brilliance, mm-hmm. and three, put good out into the world. Okay. I had to think of a third one because I really didn't know. So I, because I was thinking about, okay, so Emily has a background in teaching internationally. Yes. And I think what I have learned since we've become friends is I've heard a lot of fun stories from your international travel. Mm -hmm. And of course, we could go through a bunch of them. Yeah. But I think what would be really cool is that because you are such a gifted storyteller, I would love to hear more about your process into storytelling. And then this way, if someone is interested in storytelling, they could get some great tips And because part of when you do storytelling, I think there's a certain world where you jump up on stage where, Mm -hmm. you know, there's local story slams and things like that. And people just kind of off the top of their head tell a story. But the more you're involved, you see that there's a style and everyone's uh, system is different. Mm -hmm. But there's definitely common things, like common things to a story. So I would love to uh, reach into your brain. and yes. Pull it out. So sure. give a quick background. So everyone knows if you've listened to your last episode or even just the beginning of this one, that you are the 
Washington, D.C. Moth Grand Slam champion. Mm -hmm. You've performed in a number of shows in D.C., New York, and various other places. Mm -hmm. And so, why are you so amazing? Actually, just D.C. and New York. Shh. I just, I just, <laughs> now that so, I think about so it. So I'm like, I'm speaking in a conference in a, uh -huh. in a couple of weeks. Well, by the time this airs, it'll be already happened. And I read my bio, like when it went up on Instagram mm -hmm. and how like I've performed at these different places. And I was like, that makes it sound like I've done a lot more than I've done, but mm -hmm. I'm not mad at that. Not mad. And I felt like it was a gift she gave me. I was like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. Like it was like an S thank at you. the end of it. Like, yeah. I think it was like comedy clubs with an S. And I felt so like, oh my gosh, like, thank you. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. I can absolutely talk about yeah. that. Mm -hmm. I, um, obviously the more experiences you have, the more stories you have. Mm -hmm. Um, but I always tell people, uh, when they say things like, oh, well, I've never been there. I've never done anything interesting like that. Um, which is like a humble brag, but, uh, if, well, um, like, yeah, like I've never been out of the country yeah. or I've only ever been out of the country once or I've only mm -hmm. been to Canada or like they, they kind of like latch on to the fact that this story happens somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And you can make a story to, good out of like sitting here in this room. Exactly. See, I like, yeah. I like to say like, it doesn't actually matter where it happened. Mm -hmm. Like I could have an interaction that can turn into a story in the grocery store in my hometown. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't, it doesn't actually matter. Um, like the story that Great won, point. the story that won the grand slam was about me going to girl scout camp when I was seven, you yeah. know, that it, it didn't yeah. happen. It, it's a very common experience that people have gone to girl scout camp and, and like it, it's about how you view it. it yeah. It's, it's, it's putting on a different pair of glasses, I guess. Right. Like, like rose colored glasses. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I guess I would say rather than rose colored glasses, I would say like magnifying glasses, mm. because what I always say to my students, because I'm also an English teacher now. Right. Yeah. And um, that's actually that's helped me a bunch in storytelling because I know what story structure is. Yeah. And it, I've seen a lot of people tell stories and it seems like they have forgotten that very key part of like rising action, climax, falling action, moral, like that just. Um, oh, so, so I was going to say, so what is the structure? If someone is interested in telling a story, they need to have rising action, climax, falling action, and then the moral of the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, I think I talked about this last time that you need your setup should be, should be short. Mm -hmm. Everything you say after that should be, move the point, story yeah. forward and then your uh conclusion is one sentence mm. and um that's something i try to instill in my students as well when they're when they're telling a story writing a story like that it needs to have an end and that that people think of of these big topics um to try to tell a story in 10 minutes mm. and what you need to do is take a magnifying glass to it you can't tell your life story in 10 minutes you can tell <laughs> incorrect because your interaction with Samantha, your you guys getting together that story took at least thirty. So what I remember about what, what you remember, she yeah. remembers more of it. Yeah. Um, typical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that so I think people people get intimidated by like, well, I don't think my life is interesting or. It's not, it's not about the big scope. You need to, you need to magnify it into moments. And oh, that is that. what makes a story because I mean, every story you've tell, heard me tell mm -hmm. is about like, you know, a fraction, like an hour of my life. It's, yeah. it's not, um, or like a week, you know, a very short amount of time, like, and, the things that end up being the climax or the best part of the story are just a little moment, yeah. you know, and it's not, um, about, you don't have to, <laughs> it's not an epic poem, right? You're not, you're not up there starting <laughs> from birth to now. And when you, Iliad. yeah, exactly. And when you see someone do that, you're like, Oh no, oh. that's not going to work out. Cause it, it, it's too many things you have to have to, to make the story good and have it be um, fit the structure of a story, 
that people are interested in listening to, it has to have a very like obvious climax. Mm. And when you stretch it out too much and there's too many events, you don't know what's going to happen. Um, and the audience is bored Mm -hmm. because they think it's going to end and it doesn't or Mm. something like that. So I think that the advantage of being a teacher in this regard is that I tell stories all the time and I talk in front of people every day. Um, uh, granted they are people who have to listen to me. Um, that is true. they are legally required to be in the chairs. So <laughs> you, you have a sold out crowd every day. Yeah. That's yeah. I have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Humble sold out brag. would imply that everybody comes to school every day, but, uh, Close that's enough. <laughs> yeah. Close enough. Yeah. And, um, they're supposed to be there just cause they, they are supposed yeah. legally required. Yeah. So, uh, it's a little different, but I tell stories all the time to, um, engage them in what we're talking about. And that's, I think something when I've always found that if they have, they hear me having like a personal connection to it or mm-hmm. like, they're more likely to remember it. Yes. Like, so Oh true. yeah. That's like when, <laughs> so uh, we did a, an, a unit, this last unit that I had them do was about ethics. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause thinking critically and creatively and answering open-ended questions is such a big, uh, hard thing for my students. Um, I teach, uh, English language learners, recently arrived immigrants from Mm -hmm. many different places. Uh, and in a lot of places, creative thinking is not required nor needed because they're mostly just like copying from the board and taking tests and in other subjects you said, or in in other other countries. countries. Oh, okay. And Hmm. American education is really trying to get away from that. So it's hard to adjust to if, if that's what you're used to. And so I do this unit so I can pull that stuff out of them. And I ask them like ethical dilemmas, which are things that they'll like have the in there. train. If you like the train's going to crash and you can move yeah, the trolley it to problem. The, we did yep. the trolley problem. Yeah. Where you, you can know, move it to the other, tell, it, tell people what it is. Because they don't know. Uh, the trolley problem is a really famous ethical exercise. And I, I highly suggest you look it up because, um, it's basically, uh, choosing who's going to live and who's going to die in a very, uh, a weird situation that'll never happen. Um, like one, the first thing is you, the trolley doesn't have brakes. Uh, and y- if you keep going on the track that you're on, five people will uh, be hit and killed because they're like working on the track or whatever, however you want to frame it. The picture I have has them like uh, tied to the track. <laughs> um, but if you flip a switch in the trolley, then you can go onto another track, but there's one person. Mm-hmm. And so I have them do it in like, I show them the slide and they have to go to either side of the room. Mm-hmm. And then the next one is that now you're not the driver. There's a bridge over it. There's five people, bridge over the track, five people on the track, trolley's still out of control. And there's a fat guy in front of you that if you push him off of the bridge, he'll stop the trolley. Um, and save the five people, or if you do nothing, the five people will die. And that's so, it's, I always frame it like, obviously this is never going to happen. <laughs> but, and you have to stay inside the scenario, because they're like, what if? And I'm like, no. Mm-hmm. I ha- I'm happy that you're trying to think of a way out they're of like, it. They're like, what if the five people are murderers that are Yeah, there? they're like, oh, the guy's not going to stop the trolley. That's impossible. And I was like, this whole thing's impossible. But you have to stay in the scenario. Mm-hmm. And it, it really, I think, I remember learning about that in school. And it's mm-hmm. just, I think when you're young... There's such a black and white mentality to life that, yeah. like, good people do good things, bad people do bad things, and yeah. that's the way it is. And I just think – I feel like one of the life lessons you learn as you get older is it's like, oh, that's – you know, good people do bad things, and yeah. bad people can do good things. And are there really even – well, I mean, I, there are evil people out there, but for the most part, mm-hmm. it's like – People are trying their best and, you know. Yeah. And we don't, we're, nobody's 100% good or 100% bad. And, yeah. Um, we talk, we, um, a lot of it is, uh, we start with like our personal ethics and mm-hmm. what influences our personal ethics. And, um, we talk about like how people aren't 100% good or bad. Like we bring up Pablo Escobar, which is somebody that they're, a lot of them are really familiar with. Um, and obviously he was this like horrible drug dealer. Uh, killed a lot of people, um, did a lot of terrible things, but he also poured a bunch of money into, uh, his, um, favela, which is like his neighborhood, like slum in, mm. cl- in Colombia. And 
built like schools and houses and um, community centers and did like all these things for his neighborhood. And it's, it's like Oprah. Exactly. <laughs> you know? but, He's a drug but, dealer murderer. But that's the thing yeah. is like, you know, he did he did do does, these good things for his community. Does the end blood money justify the means? <laughs> and that's well, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that yeah. people aren't. That's an example of how people yeah. aren't 100 percent good or 100 percent bad. Yeah. Um, I mean, he used the money he made from dealing drugs and killing people to do that. Yeah. But like, I mean, that's the, that's the thing. Right. And, um, when we're talking about personal ethics, uh, something that I shared with them, we were talking about peer pressure and I was Mm -hmm. like, you know, how people like your friends, like you want to make sure that they think you're cool and sometimes you do something. Mm. And so I shared with them the story of when I was 11 and there was a bad boy in my class named Tommy Trevino and Mm. Tommy had stolen his dad's cigarettes. And me and my friends, I was with two other girls and uh, we all wanted Tommy to think we were cool. And so we tried smoking and um, yeah, just like that. And, uh, <laughs> um, they're, they're all, they're all like shocked, obviously. They're like, 11, oh my gosh, my mom. And I was like, yes. And then I went home, brushed my t- teeth six times, uh, cried and told my parents. Aww. So like that, you know, obviously, um, obviously like I still kind of stuck to my, my ethics and, and the, but then they, that's something that they remember yeah. when we're talking about the unit is like, Oh, right. Miss when you, you know, yes. tried smoking and I'm like, I know. Right. Like it's cause that's a story that like, I think, I think it's appropriate. I don't really care that they, yeah. you know, it's um moral of the story is that I'm a goody two shoes yeah. at the end of the day. My parents have later said that they were really trying to hold back their laughter. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> Because I was like so contrite. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm so sorry. And they were like, huh. yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Emily, for telling us that. Uh, like, so it, that were, it's a little off topic, but it yeah. makes me laugh. So we have friends, they have um, daughters, they're older now, but when we knew them and they were younger, and it was when they started to be able to stay home alone and they were had limited screen time that they were allowed to watch. And the girls would like rat each other out, like, mm-hmm. or, if they did, I mean, it didn't happen often, but if it did, they would write each other out. And so we were talking just recently, like looking back, we were like, uh, why didn't it ever dawn on them to be like, hey, we all can be on TV the whole time they're gone? Yeah. Like, but kids are ridiculous. It was like, they were I, so good. And then yeah. it's like, you didn't, like, we were, so we were just their own parents. We were just laughing, like, you guys do real, like, you could have been on the devices and just not yeah. told us, but you, you ratted each other, like, yeah. Just so I mean, funny. They kids are funny like that. So I, I didn't I never realized that that story of that like pathetic story of me trying smoking at a very young age, like kind of makes me like first part of the story, total badass. Total. Second part of the story, actual Emily. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't <laughs> like, try to hide it. Eleven. Eleven years old. Yeah. Eleven. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Tommy. Tommy Thanks, Trevino. Tommy. What a Shut bad boy name, too. I wonder what right? he's up to today. Yeah, good I don't know. Tommy and let's bring Trevino. Tommy in. Tommy, come on in. And then I <laughs> and then I lent him my sister's Sublime CD, and I never got it back. What, Mary? If if you listen to this, I'm I'm sorry. That's where your Sublime CD went. Did she I, not? You never told her. No, I don't oh, think sorry, so. Mary. Podcasts are a place for truth. Tommy has it. <laughs> Thanks, Tommy. And I bet he's throwing it out now because he's like, "What am I going to do with this CD?" It's the yeah. great dilemma of all yeah. the. Luckily, like, I'm sure if my sister would like to listen to Sublime, she can find it on Spotify. Yeah, on the <laughs> World Wide Web. Yeah. Uh, but she went so many web. years without her Sublime CD. Um, <sighs> yeah, and uh, so I think storytelling is a big part of teaching. Um, That's a great point. And I don't think it's just English teaching, right? I think history is all story. Everything is right? stories. Um, Public math speaking, can be, everything. like... Science has definitely got mm-hmm. a million stories. I've I've learned a lot about science through like articles about certain things, or you know, just like yeah. stories that people tell about the the book, the Mortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, is all about mm-hmm. the woman who um, whose cells, whose yes. cancer cells, were the first cells to be replicated in a lab, and how basically like. It was taken without her consent and her family never saw any of the money. These doctors got like super rich off of her, um, parts of her body. And like she ended up dying of cervical cancer. And, 
Um, it's a really interesting story about how the internal review boards are made and scientific ethics were formed. Like a lot of it stemmed from this one woman. And, wow. and so like science does have incredible yeah. stories and, um, stemmed from a, <laughs> see what I did there. It's true though. I mean, even just with everything from school to mm-hmm. like church, I think of like good sermons that kind of draw you in usually have a story yeah. parenting. Like mm-hmm. I've noticed that, you know, I see it more through when I'm watching Jeremy, but like if he'll talk about himself with the kids, like that translates mm-hmm. so much more than don't do this. And this is why you shouldn't do it versus oh, when yeah. I was a kid or what I'm struggling with now. It's like, they're so much more engaged. Oh yeah. And so, um, I think a lot of that has to do with the personal connection, right? Like, and I think that's part of why there are, the modern church sermon Mm -hmm. exists for that purpose to connect life to the Bible. If that's what you're Mm -hmm. into or whatever religion you are like that it's to make this old thing applicable and relevant to your everyday life. And I think a lot of that comes from storytelling and personal connection. And you think of all of the best speeches you've heard and it's, a lot of it is about the person and not about like advice they give or like my, my sister's <laughs> business school graduation, this like executive gets up there and just gives six points of advice and it that took anyone could have read forever. Yeah. And yeah. It, he, he's talked for so long. Six is too many points Yes, of advice. Three, keep it to three. Max. Yeah, no, that's it. That's like, and maybe just one, I don't know. Yeah. Or maybe you don't do any more speeches. But oh, burn. <laughs> yeah. Burn. No, I'm so glad you said that because I think that, you know, I started this out saying, you know, hey, let's talk about the structure of storytelling. And through our conversation, what I've realized is that storytelling is a skill that I think everyone needs. Mm-hmm. Because like you said, whether it's, a, you know, a speech, if you're a boss working with your employees, if you're a parent with your kid, you know, yeah, I just think that that art of storytelling is important. So how for you then? So one thing I think you and I have both have in common is we are willing to talk about embarrassing stuff that is often embarrassing to other people. Mm -hmm. We feed, we're fed on. I mean, when embarrassing things happen, I think you and I have that same thing, how much is more material. Yeah. Well, Um, like, and if where I get to the point where I think it's funny, then it's okay. You know? <laughs> exactly. Like I can share this. There were, I remember, I'm not going to say what I said on stage, but yeah, we can't. There's a, to, you need to come to a show if you want to hear some of yeah, these stories. The, there is one thing I said on stage and I say it in the story. I was like, I didn't tell anyone this happened for five years mm-hmm. because I was so embarrassed. Yeah. And now nine years later, it's funny, it's but funny. it took, a really, really long, long time, time for me to get there. Um, but you know what? That's a great yeah. point because, and that, and that actually gets kind of with the tying it in and kind of full circle with the podcast mm-hmm. is, you know, same thing with me is I told my, you know, personal embarrassing story kind of to some, you know, Jeremy at first and then a few friends and things like that. And I like with pooping my pants, just if this is your first mm-hmm. episode. And so, but what's interesting is that same level of shame and embarrassment, it, it, it's that same pit in your stomach, whether it's something seemingly trivial or mm-hmm. something super serious. Yeah. And it's that same fear of rejection, mm-hmm. things like that. And that I think that's why it's so important for, for like healing. And if it's something trivial, I mean, just telling some friends, it kind of helps you over the hump of like, yeah, this is just mm-hmm. kind of funny. Oh, yeah. But then there's like serious real trauma stuff yeah. that if you keep it inside, it starts to have power over you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a story that what story are you telling yourself about that experience? Yeah. And then that's where the lies happen and things like that. And I just feel like when you tell the story, you're able to identify the lies, you know, Mm -hmm. the parts in it that you might feel that you're blaming yourself for. Um, And then it just holds, I feel like the more you tell a story, the less power it has over you. Yeah. Um, and so, to eventually you're like, oh, this is funny. And now you're like, you don't care. So people, if they're embarrassed for you when you share something, yeah. whether it's our trivial stories that we tell or it's super serious, I just feel like the more life I'm living, I'm realizing that it's like, oh, whatever feeling they have, it's their own stuff. Yeah. It's not about me. It's not about us. And I think that with one of the reasons that like people who experience traumatic things, like much worse, obviously, than like 
the stuff we've talked about on stage, that's one of the reasons that therapy is so important mm-hmm. because, you know, being able to talk about it and have somebody like filter, help you filter mm-hmm. the lies you tell yourself. And um, when someone, you know, obviously the last time I talked about like my story about um, depression and, mm-hmm. and, um, attempting suicide and yeah. the, you know, when the people came up to me after this, like after I told it and mm-hmm. expressed having the same, it's ex- like a similar experience or struggling with a similar thing. It like does actually make you feel less alone and like better about the power that it might have over you and, yeah. and trying to get rid of that power. And, um, it's, yeah, I, I don't shy away. I think in general from mm-hmm. talking about things that uh, people aren't always comfortable with. Um, I think that's I'm, the beauty of like talking about some of the seemingly shocking stuff yeah. is it shows, I think that you have the power of showing people that you're a safe person. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, I agree. Like I feel, I feel like if I am willing to talk about stuff that, and I always tell people like, when they're like, maybe this is too much information. I was like, Oh, that doesn't oh, exist with uh-uh. me. I don't care. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that that I want them to know that, like, you can say this stuff to me. I don't care. Like, mm-hmm. this weird stuff that happened in a, a really personal thing. Like, I also have weird <laughs> personal things that have happened <laughs> to me. Because that's what like, you learn. The more you yeah. share, that's like, the more you share your shit, the more you realize everyone else has shit, too. And it may yeah. not be the same, but the feelings are the same. That's yeah. what I'm finding is that it's like that core gut feeling. Yeah. And I've realized that. So for me, and I think I may have mentioned this on the Reverse podcast. I don't know. But like kind of my mission and what I'm kind of feel like being led more to do is this whole, the common theme I've heard myself say and other people say is I thought I was going to take this to the grave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what good does that get you? No, it doesn't. I mean, I think that it's, uh, it's really important to share your experiences. And I think that's one of the greatest, um, tragedies of, uh, the generation, like my parents' generation, the kind of like legit baby boomers, like mm-hmm. actually born in the forties. Yeah. Um, is that they were it's so ingrained in the men of that generation to not talk about things. Mm-hmm. And that I think that so much of their lives go un you know, unheard. And yeah. and like my dad is is a really good example of that. He has lived a really interesting life. I mean, yeah. His stories from like Vietnam have trickled out of him for my mm. entire life. Like I have a thimble full of stories from this man, right? Yes. And I've known him my whole life. <laughs> really? <laughs> from the first moment. And <laughs> he, I think as he gets older and just like maybe because society is changing and I think he's also trying to personally be more yeah. um, aware and open about that stuff that he's shared more. And, and it's like, how did I not know this until I was 32? Yeah. Like, and you realize your um, parents are people too, not yeah. just your parents. It's a crazy thing. Yeah. And I mean, my mom's been blabbing her whole, <laughs> my whole life. I, we're the same. Yeah. Mom. Um, and so it's very stark contrast, right? Yeah. Like I know all these things about my mom's life. And then my dad is just like this very Enigma. closed book, um, very stoic, you know, Vietnam veteran. Yeah. And he, you know, and then he tells like, so neither of my parents are big drinkers. Like every so often they'll have uh, a cocktail or a drink, but not, not a lot. And um, then my dad tells me, and this is like my whole life, right? Like, so there was never any alcohol in our house, like maybe a wine cooler mm-hmm. sometimes if my, my mom was feeling frisky, but like <laughs> they, uh, I just like always have a memory of them. They, they've, I've never seen them. Like I've never seen my dad drunk. Yeah. Um, I might've seen my mom drunk in my adulthood, but, um, weddings will do that to you. Oh yeah. <laughs> and me and my sister like, drink, drink, drink. <laughs> <laughs> now that you're old enough to, pre- <laughs> yeah. now that you can pure, peer except not peer pressure. Them. Yeah. You can... She's like, okay, but <laughs> I don't care. Um, he, I think that he told me this when I was in my twenties that he was in a tent in a meeting in Vietnam. And he's like, like a, with a high rank, like high ranking people. I forget the exact rank, but somewhere high. Mm-hmm. And he was an army ranger and, oh, um, so yeah. And he like, uh, they were passing during this meeting He's got the uh, orders on the ground next to him. And 
um, they're passing around a bottle of Johnny Rocker Black and they're taking shots out of it. And so obviously they get really drunk during this meeting. And my dad leans over and he barfs right on the orders, which is so funny. Like, he's just like, blah! And, then, and, <laughs> and he's just, like, and I never drank again. Yeah, he was like, uh, yeah, they weren't really happy about that. And it's, you know, like, these are the things that come out of him. And, like, the, my favorite story of my dad in Vietnam is he... And it's almost all because of the way he tells it. So they're in the middle of the jungle, like, deep, deep, deep Vietnamese jungle, and he gets, he's putting, getting in a sleeping bag and he gets stung by a scorpion. Oh. Right? And he's like, uh, and he's telling me that. I'm like, so did you call for help? He was like, well, I figured that if, uh, I called for help, it would take at least an hour to get there. And if the scorpion was poisonous, that I would be dead by then. <laughs> so, so I logical. figured I'd just wait it out. <laughs> And it hurt like hell, but I didn't die. I was like, what? <laughs> but I didn't die. Like, he was like, no, no. If it's going to kill me, it will. It will. Yeah. It's, I, is it wrong? Like, there's no, he's like, no, no, no. Don't call the helicopter. I'll be dead by the time it gets here if it's going to kill me. Do you think that's, like, the secret of life, though? Like, if you I just move know. on with that attitude, it's like, he, I was just like what, what are we going to do? Um, Does he not have anxiety of any kind? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like, that sounds... I think he has anxiety, like, related to me. Yeah. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> like, stop. Like, when I, like, do, you know, I go feel abroad. about you with yeah, yours? He's like, uh, I went to Honduras this summer, like, last summer, Ooh. and he was like, Emily, I just, I don't know. What about Sweetheart, on stage? Sweetheart, I don't know. Because I've seen him at your shows. I know. He always comes. That's so sweet. sweet. Yeah. So, like, how does he feel when you're telling your stories? Um, He's just like, so my parents are, like, really, really sweet. They're just, like, so proud of me for breathing. Um, and Classic millennial. So he was like, you were, the, you were the best. You were the you best. Were the best. <laughs> you were the best. best. You were the best, sweetheart. You yeah. always are. <laughs> Oh, I love your dad. Yeah, he's, like, very supportive. So um, I do – I will say that, like, my parents are not very reliable critics. Yeah, they're not, like – Because it's either um, they're too supportive or it's the other side you're, you're where you're, like – talk about that? You're really going to talk about that on stage? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of, like – Mm. Yeah, they're mm. and not really about storytelling. I think I mean in general, <laughs> mm. just like mm. really overly critical. Mm. No in between. But they but they make up for it by the really supportive. Oh yeah 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 yeah. yeah. I, they're much more supportive than than uh, overly critical. That's but great. I feel like there's no in between. Like there's it's it's never like a, it's never um, like a good source of like yeah how am I doing? Because <laughs> it's either yeah. like it's you know ninety five percent like. You're the best. This is amazing. And 5% like, ooh, I literally haven't seen anyone do that worse. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's nowhere in between. But, um, oh. yeah, I mean, they're, my parents have been super supportive. They were uh, a really sweet thing. Um, I don't think I've said this yet Aww. to anyone. But so my parents got divorced three years ago after 43 years of being married, which is super weird as a 30 year old to deal with. Um, but that's a story for another day. But anyway, like they've all, they've been cordial to each other. Like it wasn't, uh, nothing like big happened or anything. It just, um, so like there wasn't another person or, you know, nothing like yeah. that to make them hate each other, but like, yeah. so they've been like cordial and mm -hmm. we've had some holidays together since then and it's been okay. But, um, I had, for the Grip Moth Grand Slam, mm -hmm. my, my mom hasn't been able to come to any of my shows because she always has class on Wednesday. She's a college professor. She has class on Wednesdays. She couldn't come. And, like, that's yeah. when all my shows are on Wednesdays, right? Yeah. And um, so she is just really bummed about that. And uh, so they were both able to come to the Moth Grand Slam. And I had comped my ticket for my mom. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> um, and... The comp tickets, you were allowed to sit with the storyteller up front, but my dad saved her a seat and she sat with him. And oh. like, so they 
watched me together and they were able to like because I like roast both of them in it. Yes, yes, <laughs> and, you do. It's great. And but they like loved it and they were they could sit there, you know, mm-hmm. and just like kinda like elbow each other, like, oh yeah, I remember that and like yeah. um I talked about how my family didn't camp because my dad had done enough camping in Vietnam and he was really not into <laughs> camping anymore. Yes. Um and he, my mom said that he like laughed really, really loud at that and, and they took me out um, we went to Silver Diner afterwards and like had some milkshakes and it was like this moment where my story and like my performance like brought them back together as human beings and like having a connection, even if it was just for that like night, mm. it was really nice that they could like remember the good parts of their marriage and like I think that's good raising for you kids. Too. Yeah, it was for really you for me that. it was like a very healing experience. And like yes. I would say that I I you know, I don't like want mommy and daddy to get back together, but I <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um it was nice. It, it felt like really there was a lot of like closure and like the birth of kind of a new relationship. I love you know I just I love mean? the way you said it, the birth of a new relationship yeah. because I think that it goes back to what we talked about, about, you know, when you're young, it's black and white. Families yeah. stay together, yeah. you know, and that's, this is the way a family looks and this and that. And then you get older and you realize things change and mm-hmm. maybe people aren't, you know, good together and paths yeah. change and things like that. But I think that that doesn't change what we want at the core, which is yeah. kind of everything to be okay. Yeah. And it seems like that, it seems like that that experience kind of showed your heart that like, everything's okay. It doesn't have to look the way I thought it would look. And I I don't think it was just for me. I Mm -hmm. think that they, um, and I haven't talked to them about this. Mm -hmm. I don't think I want to, but like, if they listen, if they listen to this and they will, um, thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Um, they, because it had been this kind of weird dance of like, what do you do when you are still like pretty interconnected as, two people who are not in a relationship anymore Mm -hmm. um, and who still like get along. Yeah. But um, don't spend any time together, obviously Mm -hmm. like, and it was a really nice moment of, you know, like reminding, I think especially my dad that like, there's a reason you guys got married and like stayed together for as long as you did. You know, it wasn't all the annoying stuff and the stuff that made you guys want to split up. But since then, I feel like I've noticed a su- like a slight subtle change mm. in their relationship. Just like just a little nicer. Everybody's a little nicer. And that is really, really cool. I like that. Yeah. Emily, thank you so much for coming back on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for talking to me for two and a half hours. Hell, I appreciate it. Yeah, don't worry. It will not be two and a half yeah. hours <laughs> when, we, when we do it. We will mm-hmm. zippity doo dah that uh, down. Hey, can I say something before we leave? Yeah, please do. Um, did you know if you have any roofing, siding, uh, gutter, or any exterior housing needs, did you know there's someone that you can call? In the Northern Virginia area? In the area? Northern Virginia area? Yeah. Uh, do you know yeah. who that is? I do. But I would love to hear you tell us. It's Eminem Exteriors. Eminem Exteriors. You can call them at 703-722-8833. They're the best. They're the best. Anything on the outside of your home, they got it. Roofing. Yeah. Siding. Gutters. gutters. Windows. Doors. Yes. Boom. Not garden gnomes, though. Not garden gnomes. I want to stipulate that. Thank you. Thank You're you for welcome. stipulating that because mm-hmm. I do not want people calling, asking oh, for garden hell. gnomes and saying, I heard I could get garden gnomes on the Fleshing It Out podcast. Oh, that'd be really embarrassing. It would be so embarrassing. Yeah. And Just wanted to let them know that. Thank you. Thank you that they are amazing and we appreciate them. And Yes. Thank yeah. you for your money. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> well, Emily, thank you. Please um, come back. Mm-hmm. Uh, please come to all of... Um, our shows, and if anyone wants to see you in a show, I have can... absolutely nothing lined up. But you can check me out on Instagram at Emily Yerson. Still don't have a website. Perfect. Don't need one. Nope. All good. One. All good. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Thank you. And that's a wrap for now. Thanks for listening to Flushing It Out with Samantha Spittle. 
Music provided by TwinMusicom.org. Song titled, Night at the Dance Hall. Sound editing by me, Jeremy Spittle. A special thanks to our studio sponsor, M&M Exteriors. Visit their website at mmexteriors.com for all of your roofing, siding, and gutter needs in the Northern Virginia area. Visit our website at flushingitout.com and be sure to subscribe. This has been a Spitfire production. That was the greatest thing I've ever heard. Don't forget to check out the after show on the Full Flush bonus episode where Samantha and I continue the conversation with our guest. You can find the Full Flush episode right here on Flushing It Out every Friday.